Welcome boys and girls, men and women, children of all ages. Today we will be working on Robin Beth Shares Nomad. If you don't already, make sure you stop the video and find a copy of that. It'll make it easier to read along and understand the poem. Um, Robin Beth Share is an acclaimed poet and writer, and I'm very honored to be working on this poem. Um, now, when we first start explicating a poem, you want to look at the title, and our title is Nomad. And a nomad is described, rather defined, uh, as a wanderer, one who doesn't stay in one place, but moves around for the sake of finding pastures and fertile lands to survive. Um, I also find it interesting that nomad sounds like not mad, um, and that goes to say that sometimes people think that people who wander um, are angry. Um, as the old saying goes, not all who wander are lost. Um, though cliche, it's true. A nomad isn't angry or happy or doing anything else that way. It's just a way of surviving, and this poem is about survival and morality. And now I will read the poem. <clears throat> in a time of faint beasts, no room is left in the boats. With thin hands, we huddle sheep and dip a hundred reeds in mud. The nets wheel away so often now, sinking through days poured furious over threshing feet. As though dared in a foreign tongue to nod our sleeves, we swim through broken oars, shout off slender days. Snakes may cling to trees and men tear at bread, but the sky stays hinged. Only heaven is full of furniture. We harness ourselves over and over, wherever hope is a yellow shore. This poem is a septet, meaning that there are seven stanzas, and the way that it's divided is the first three stanzas come together to form one idea. The following stanzas, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, um, create another idea, and following that we see a volta, which means a shift um, into the seventh stanza, the last one, which gives us an answer. It's a comment on the ideas evoked in the earlier parts of the poem. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the first um, first stanza and the first set and decide what it's meaning, what's it telling us. So the poem opens up with the phrase, in a time of faint beasts. Um, what's really interesting about this is that we it's, a, it's obviously a time period, but it's described as being of faint beasts. Faint means vague, so it means that it, we don't know much about that time, we don't know much about what's going on there. There's a lot um, that's vague about it, and what else is um, interesting is she uses the word beasts. Um, we see her use words in the poem like sheep and later snakes, so other animals, but she doesn't say animals, she says beasts, and whenever I see Sarah McLaughlin in commercials, she doesn't use the word beasts to bring sympathy, so there's something less sympathetic about beasts, and I think that's done purposefully in the poem, something to demonstrate uh, what we see as animals. From here, the little translation of the poem goes something about uh, along the lines of putting animals on a, a ship um, and people getting on a ship, uh, handling sheep and working on a boat, a net wheeling away, an aggressive current and a storm, what appears to be a storm, um, and unable to understand why or how the ship has wrecked, um, it's, it's literally wrecking. The poetic characters are swimming through the wreckage, looking up to see something to hold on to, and ultimately they're searching for safety. They're searching for a shore that they can um, arise on so they can find a shore. Something that my research brought me to was a London Post by Alex James that talks about why animals are such great, um, such great things to have, such great living beings to have um, that help create a home, make uh, a better community and family. Um, and I think that's really important when we consider the uh, previous discussion about beasts and animals and the fact that they're bringing sheep on board. From here, uh, we're going to jump right into it and we're just going to, something I noticed right away that I got to say is that the major pronoun of the poem is we. That's the individual that we're focused on. I said before it was the poetic characters, but the word is we. Um, we huddle sheep and dip a hundred reeds in mud. Uh, we swim through broken oars and we harness ourselves. Um, are the major actions of the characters in the poem. So it's we, and by we, uh, the poem is talking about humanity. It's all of us, us, as a people. So what really becomes a major uh, factor is the biblical references, and there's three of them in this poem, and that's what really drives the meaning of the poem home. Uh, it drives, it really creates both the subject matter as well as um, builds for the comment that the poem has on that subject matter, and we'll discuss that right now. 
The first biblical allusion is Noah's Ark, the Great Flood, um, specifically referenced by faint beasts, no room left in the boats, huddling sheep, and furious over threshing feet, all describing uh, the story of Noah's Ark and the Great Flood and the wrath that God had on mankind for their wickedness. Um, in the story, it specifically tells uh, Noah as well to gather unclean livestock, which would be the huddled sheep in this case, the reeds. The second biblical reference is at the beginning of the second section of the fourth stanza, as though dared in a foreign tongue, um, directly relates to the biblical story of Babel's Tower, in which the actual Bible story goes, they are, God says, they are one people, one language. Only the beginning, nothing now will it be impossible for mankind. Following which God says, let us go down there and confuse their language in a way to spread them among, uh, spread mankind out amongst the earth rather than have them work together. The third biblical allusion is Adam and Eve, the story um, specifically referencing uh, the snakes may clean the trees and men tear at bread. Um, it's very much like the story goes, uh, the snake deceiving Adam and Eve in the garden telling them that they will be like gods if they eat from the fruit of the tree of good and uh, evil. And so they do, and God is displeased, and he casts them out and spreads them out amongst the earth and punishes mankind for their disobedience and betrayal. Objectively, this might seem a little unfair, um, that this God is, uh, is apparently being oppressive uh, to the people, um, to humanity, uh, who in the poem is referenced as we, um, punishing them for seeking out knowledge, seeking out God, um, and thinking for themselves, being free thinkers. Some research I did for this project led me to a book called The Holy War in the Bible, Christian Morality. Um, it talks about Christian ethics um, that can seem contradicting, um, uh, such as the double standard of not killing, but the exception of killing if it's in God's name, which brings about the philosophical question, is God good because of pre-existing good that God always follows, or is it God good because whatever God does is good, period? So we see that the first part of the poem all the way up to the first six stanzas is about God putting mankind in their place. Um, regardless of the morality there, that's what it's about, and that's what's happening. Um, what's interesting to note is that this poem is specifically describing the scene of a shipwreck, and Robin Beth Sher's um, new book, the one that came out just before this poem was published, is called Shipbreaking. Some research that I did for this um, led me to a really great book called A Sea of Misadventures, which is actually about um, nautical travel and sailors uh, in the early uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, basically colonial times. and. Uh, a whole section, chapter 3 in the book, from page 52 all the way through 76, is dedicated specifically to God, nature, and the role of religion in shipwrecks. Um, and the section states, Theology um, says shipwrecks made sense as retribution for sin, a chance for redemption, or a reminder of God's power. The Christian faith reconstructed the terrifying and random events in meaningful experiences. In short, shipwrecks were justified as... Um, examples of God's power and retribution for for whatever people had done wrong. Um, another biblical allusion to that is Jonah in the stomach of the whale when he tries to sail away to another land. These stories are used by the Christian faith to make sense and reason uh, for for God's power and benevolence. So what do we need to take away from this? Well, after the Volta, we see the shift into the seventh stanza, and I love the last stanza, uh, it says, We harness ourselves over and over wherever hope is a yellow shore. As radical as the idea may seem, some research I have taken um, suggests that it may be right in the poem's suggestion that humans don't need a babysitter. They don't need to be guided or punished or told what's right or wrong all the time. They can reason for themselves. I compiled some research on Gnosticism, which arrived in the second century A.C.E. or A.D., and it's basically uh, talking about a claim to knowledge coming from the Greek Gnostikoi, um, meaning that there's a knowledge, an actual knowledge, and people claimed in the Christian faith specifically a uh, specific private knowledge of certain Christian values and beliefs. Oddly enough, the sources found at Nag Hammad, which is an Egyptian city, uh, were part of the 
Apocryphon of John, uh, ultimately they contradicted some of the stories in the Christian faith and most importantly brought forward a different kind of understanding of how the world was formed in the same similar uh, biblical stories. The biggest thing being that they talked about mankind being less of a poor sinful race and more of a uh, race of beings uh, looking to reach divinity again, to get closer to God to the point, and God being less of an all-knowing, all-powerful being, and rather being uh, faulty in some ways. And basically, it, it draws us to be closer to God. Should there be one, we're more like Him than we think we are, um, in respect. Based on another source I have from Medical Base, it talks about the dangers of mistranslation. And a lot of this mistranslation occurs um, in the Gnosticism, uh, belief system and origins as compared to the Christian faith and that can be very dangerous when we talk about long-term morality and effects and beliefs. But getting back to the point, if humans can help themselves then how can they go about that? In what way? Gnosticism says that there is no perfect God and that we are closer to them than we think. Um, and something that Rosalind Hershaus, a professional philosopher, comes forward and says is virtue ethics is a great way to explain how humans can be better. It talks about knowledge being the key, moral knowledge, something called the phrenesis, which was uh, something Aristotle talked about, a total knowledge. This poem specifically references this by saying we harness ourselves, harness ourselves over and over, and this is the same idea in virtue ethics as to train ourselves by experience, to learn, and as we learn we get closer to this idea of perfect knowledge, and it's how we become better people. Regardless of religious fundamentals, uh, the human spirit is fighting and breathing and living and always looking to survive. And that's what this poem really is striving to get across, this idea of survival. That regardless of what God has done in this shipwreck, whether or not it was meant for you, whether it was a sinful thing, you can help yourself. You can reason this. It's why we harness ourselves. We do it. We harness ourselves. The subject is affecting the direct object, which is us. We are both. Humanity is both. And so wherever there's a yellow shore, yellow being gold and yellow representing a, a good end to things, something that we want, that we desire, we will harness ourselves wherever we can find that hope. That is the epitome of human survival right there. Stephen Hawking was once quoted as saying, one cannot prove that God doesn't exist, but God isn't necessary. It is by human nature that we survive and thrive. I appreciate you watching this video. I hope you, uh, I hope you took something away from it. Um, feel free to comment on the video. Uh, let me know what I can do better. This is my first explication. I hope to do more. I want to thank Hobie and Kate from Clemson University for helping me videotape. Um, there they are, uh, being beasts and animals. Um, so thank you again, and comment rate, and I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, okay.